Thanks everyone for being here and welcome to my bedroom. Um, I actually made the bed this morning. I'm not gonna show you, but take my word for it because um, you were all gonna be visiting me here uh, today. So I wanna thank Ari for inviting me. And also one of the patrons of this program, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Kaufman of Needham, Massachusetts, who I actually don't know personally, but I gave this talk a couple of months ago um, when the book first came out uh, Jeffrey was on the call and recommended me to Ari, and that's how I ended up being here today. So the, the story I'm going to tell you today is a, it's a small but entertaining footnote in Jewish history, maybe a slightly larger footnote in uh, women's history, um, but it's a totally idiosyncratic story. I'm going to do three things. I'm going to tell you how this story found me, because I didn't find it, it literally found me, and how I came to write two books about the woman I'm going to tell you about. Then I'm going to tell you a little bit about the social and historical context in which this bicycle trip around the world took place, because that's important to understanding how Annie, uh, the woman we're going to talk about, was able to build her worldwide fame in the 1890s. And then the third thing I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly breeze through her journey itself. Um, Okay, this is it. It's not advancing. Uh, excuse me, RM. Okay, I'm, let me see. There we go. So, this is the book that uh, just came out on uh, June 1st, and I'm going to um, tell you how I, I came to write it. My acquaintance with the woman uh, in this story really came uh, out of the blue in the form of a letter from a complete stranger in 1993. It was written to my mother by a man who said he was researching the story of the first woman to ride a bicycle around the world. And he had done some genealogical research and had come to the conclusion that my mother, Bela Cohen, was somehow related to the woman he was researching. My mother, it was clear from the letter that he had found the right family, but my mother had never heard of this woman and knew nothing about a bicycle trip. In this letter, he enclosed a couple of newspaper clippings from the 1890s, one from Boston and another from Omaha, Nebraska, about this woman who was calling herself Annie Londonderry, and I'll get to why she called herself that in a moment. Um, and, but, but, but the mystery was, why did nobody in my family know about this? We were not able to help him in his research, and I put this letter and those newspaper clippings in a file where they sat for 10 years. In 2003, the same fellow wrote me another letter. He said, I'm wondering if you found anything else about this woman since I last wrote to you 10 years ago. And the answer was no. I had in the interim asked everyone in my family that I knew if they had ever heard of her or about this bicycle trip and drew a complete blank from everyone. But by this time, I had become an avid cyclist myself. And the story seemed so incredible, I couldn't understand why no one in my family knew about it. So I decided I would give chase myself out of my own curiosity, see if I could find out something about her. I knew from the newspaper account that this fellow had sent that her trip began at the Massachusetts Capitol in Boston in 1894. So I decided to call the library at this Massachusetts State House. And the woman who answered the phone, the librarian who answered the phone, Ava Murphy, when I told her what I was interested in, I wanted to know if they had any record, documents, photographs of this woman who left, left from there on a bicycle in 1894. She didn't even hesitate for one second before she told me, I know we don't have anything about her here. Because I had an email from a fellow in Texas a couple of weeks ago seeking information about her too. Now, this story was nowhere to be found on the internet. There was nothing about her. And I couldn't imagine who in the world in Texas was also interested in this story. She said, if he gives me permission, I'll put you in touch with him. His name was Dennis McCown. He was a professor in, in Austin. And uh, I emailed him and I told him how I had gotten, you know, that I'd gotten his name and that I was related to the woman who he had inquired about. And I got this message back from Dennis. He said, oh my God, a relative of Annie Londonderry's. 
I was, of course, curious to know how he had stumbled onto this story and what his interest was. We quickly established that we were not related. I thought maybe he was a distant relative. And he told me a story that I'm going to relate to you now. And it's going to seem like it's, you're going to wonder where it's going, but I assure you it's, it's relevant. He said he was researching the story of an ancestor of his own, a woman named Helen Beulah Morose, who lived in El Paso, Texas in the 1890s. Her husband, Martin, was a ne'er-do-well who'd been arrested on a cattle rustling charge. And he escaped the law by going across the river into Juarez, Mexico. So his wife, Helen, hired a lawyer in El Paso by the name of John Wesley Harden. John Wesley Harden, whose name you may know, was the most feared gunslinger of the Old West in his youth. Had spent half of his life in prison, and when he got out, opened up a law practice in El Paso, believe it or not. So Helen Morose, this is the story Dennis is telling me now, hired John Wesley Harden to help with her husband's legal troubles. And she and Harden fell into a passionate uh, love affair. And on the night of June 24th, 1895, four men paid by Harden murdered Helen's husband at the El Paso city dump. And Dennis was wondering, he was exploring this and wondering where was John Wesley Harden on the night of this murder? And what he found out in his research is that Harden and Helen were sitting in a theater, listening to a lecture by a young woman from Boston who was going around the world on a bicycle. When Dennis told me this story, the idea that my Jewish great grand aunt had somehow crossed paths with the most famous, notorious outlaw of the Old West. It was absolutely flooring. And I said, I've got to find out more. And that's what really spurred me on. Dennis provided me with some of the newspaper clippings from the El Paso newspapers about her visit there, which was written about extensively. And one of them contained an important tidbit that opened up a lot of my research. It said that when Annie left El Paso in July of 1895, she was now a year into her trip, she followed the Santa Fe railway tracks north. Now, since very few newspapers were searchable online at that point, I literally started calling the libraries in small towns north of El Paso all along the Santa Fe route, seeing if I could enlist their help and doing some research in the local newspapers to find out if I could find information about Annie. And sure enough, every library I called got back to me within about a week or so after doing some research, old microfilm, finding articles about Annie's travels north of El Paso. And I began to pinpoint her progress on a map. This is pretty painstakingly slow, slow way to work. At the same time, I had engaged a specialist in Jewish genealogy that lived in my town to see if I could find uh, any other, di any direct living descendants of Annie's who might be able to shed light on this story. And I'm gonna come back to that in a moment. So who was this woman who called herself Annie Londonderry? She was born Annie Cohen. She was my great grandfather's sister. She was born around, 19, around 1870 near Riga, Latvia, and came to the United States with her two older siblings and her parents in 1875 and settled in Boston. In her, in her teens, just as a you know, teenager, 17 years old, 18 years old, she was in an arranged marriage with Max Kopchowski, a Ukrainian immigrant to Boston. She had never ridden a bicycle except for a couple of lessons before she set out from Boston on this round the world trip. Now, one of the things I learned about Annie from a small item in the New York World newspaper after I began doing my research was rather startling. When she left Boston in June of 1894, she was already a mother of three young children under the ages of five. I was at first rather astonished by this piece of information. Here was a, a young Jewish mother leaving her children and her husband behind. And this, by the way, is a stumbling block for a lot of people who hear about her story and who read the book. They can't get past this rather selfish and 
self-centered decision to leave her family, um, what would seem like a lark. And we'll come back to that as well. But it was this piece of information that gave me hope that by hiring this genealogist, I might track down some direct living descendants because if her children had children of their own, I figured they might still be alive. And in fact, it took a year, but we found Annie's only direct living descendant, a granddaughter, Mary, uh, then in her 70s in Larchmont, New York. And Spin, the novel, takes the form of a letter that Annie writes later in her life, explaining herself, her life and her journey to her granddaughter. Annie was referred to by one Iowa newspaper as an inventive genius. As we're gonna see, she was a brilliant self-promoter, a masterful creator of her own myth, she had a very casual relationship with the truth, and this becomes an important part of her story. As she traveled around the world on her bicycle at various times, because Annie was all about getting attention, she understood what the masters of Silicon Valley understand very well. Attention equals money. She had to finance this trip around the world. She wanted to be good copy. She was good entertainment, so she spun a lot of tall tales as she traveled. She claimed at various times, for example, to be a Harvard medical student. I was gullible enough when I first saw this to call Harvard looking for her transcript to be only to be told that women were not admitted to Harvard Medical School until the 1940s. She claimed at other times to be a lawyer, an accountant, a wealthy heiress, an orphan, the inventor of a new type of stenography, the founder of a newspaper, the cousin of a congressman, the niece of a senator, None of this was true. Annie was one of a world champion embellisher, and she spun these tales to entertain audiences and reporters as she went. When I decided to write my first book about her, which was published in 2007, I had some publishers who encouraged me at that point to write this story as historical fiction because the historical record was rather thin. But I didn't want to do that because I didn't want to obscure the, what really happened because her story was basically lost to history. And I saw my job as documenting what actually happened. As I got further and further into my research, thinking that I was documenting the story of the first woman to be able to claim the title of the first woman to go around the world by bicycle, it, began to, it, it, it just began to become gradually obvious to me that there were gaps in her story. She was, her time, her, the time frame wasn't working. So I began to sort of doubt the story she was telling. And at first I was really disappointed. But as I got further into it, what I realized is that I actually had a more interesting character on my hands. This was not just the story of a woman of great physical and, and endurance and mental fortitude. It was a story of a very complicated uh, woman with ample flaws, but who accomplished something quite remarkable. So I resisted writing this as historical fiction back in 2007. So what prompted me to revisit this and write it as historical fiction? And some of you may be familiar that the New York Times for the past few years has been doing a series of obituaries called Overlooked. These are mainly obituaries of women and people of color who the Times in retrospect feel that they overlooked in their day. And in November of 2019, this obituary of Annie appeared in the New York Times. I did not know it was coming. A lot of it relied on the book I just told you about. And my wife, Judy, who's very connected to the book club world through her business, um, and who knows what book clubs love and what they're reading, she looked at me and she basically ordered me to write this book as, as a novel. She said, you've already done the research. Everybody loves reading historical fiction. All my book groups want to read historical fiction about women that, that teaches them something new about a period in history they don't know about, maybe a lot about. So Judy's usually got good ideas, and I figured I would get about 20 pages in and realize I'm not capable of writing a novel because I had never written one. Uh, but the rest, as they say, is history. My agent liked it, and it, it became a book. So that's how this story found me and why I wrote it as a historical fiction, basically because my wife told me to. So where did Annie come from? And where did the genesis of this, what was the genesis of this trip? 
So Annie's family settled in the old west end of Boston. If you're familiar with Boston, this is where Mass General Hospital is today. It's a neighborhood that was largely raised to the ground to make room for these urban renewal projects of the 1950s, but it had a very rich cultural history. It was, it was the most diverse neighborhood in America at the time. There was a large Jewish community, Irish community, African-American community, Poles, Italians, all living in this very condensed part of Boston. And for a young woman with some imagination, she, would, she, she went about her daily life. She would have heard many languages spoken. She would have smelled the aromas of all the foods being cooked on summer days when the windows were open. And it would have been enough to fire the imagination of a young woman sort of chafing at the bit uh, to escape a life of uh, a domestic life that she was not happy in. The, the next image I'm going to show you uh, is from Punch magazine in 1896. I can't tell you for sure that Annie inspired it, but it very much captures um, her story. She was a forward thinking woman, obviously, um, very much uh, bristling about the uh, under the constraints of um, you know, life for a, a woman of her time, particularly in a, a kind of, you know, small Jewish community where her, the expectation was that she would raise uh, these children. She was incredibly frustrated in this life at the age of 22 or 23, already the mother of three children, looking after two younger siblings after their parents had died, and she was looking for a way out. So how did the story, how did she get going? What prompted her to get onto this bicycle? It was reported all over the world that the catalyst for this trip was a wager between two wealthy Boston merchants who were debating one of the big issues of the day, women's equality, the women's suffrage, um, and the bet was 20,000 to 10,000 that a woman couldn't bike around the globe, which only a man had done before. There were conditions attached. She had to make the circuit in 15 months, had to cover 10,000 miles by bicycle. She had to begin without a penny in her pocket and earn 5,000 en route, which she could wire back. So what was the point of this? This was not going to be simply a test of a woman's physical endurance and her mental fortitude. It was set up to be a test of a woman's ability to fend for herself in the world. If it has a slight echo for you, I think of it as an early iteration of that tennis match between Billie Jean King and Bobby Riggs, which many of you may remember uh, from, I think, the 70s. There was also a significant amount of money at stake for her. Um, this is a lot of money in those days, you can imagine. $10,000 if she succeeded. And when I say other conditions added along the way, at her convenience, Annie would add conditions to explain things to report it. For example, she told one reporter she was not allowed to contract matrimony during the trip, although she was already married, something that she hid very well uh, most of the time. That was a way that she could rebuff an unwanted suitor. If she decided she needed to cover some miles by train, she would say, I'm allowed 1,500 miles by train. So those are the other conditions that she would add to suit her purposes. So quickly, the historical social context for this. Three things were, three powerful currents sort of washing over the 1890s and at their intersection is where Annie built her fame. Number one, this was an era of intense globalization. We think of this as a late 20th century phenomenon, but it was also a late 19th century phenomenon. You could now travel by steamship from New York to, to France in less than a week. News was traveling around the world in a matter, matter of hours because of the telegraph. So people had, people in this country and all, they were having, you know, their curiosity was really being stoked about the world in which they lived. And world travelers at that time almost became the reality TV stars of their day. People were very curious to learn about the world through these travelers. We'll talk about some of them. The second social phenomenon of the time was the bicycle craze of the 1890s, especially among women. Bicycling became a huge 
leisure pastime in Europe and the United States in the 1890s. The sport really became open to women with the change evolution of the bicycle, which I'll talk about briefly. But women were buying bicycles by the millions. And then that combined with the women's movement for social equality and suffrage, the work of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony. Um, the bicycle became a symbol of the women's suffrage movement. And we'll come back to that in a moment. The other echo you probably sense in Annie's story goes back to this book, Around the World in 80 Days, published in 1872, which sort of captured the ethos uh, of the time and people people's increasing curiosity about the world, this serialized novel in which Jules Verne's character, Phileas Fogg, wagers these wealthy clubmen in London that he can make it around the world in less than 80 days. Now that journey inspired other real life journeys, including the first person to bike around the world, Thomas Stevens, who did it on this high wheel bicycle, it took him three years. The other famous, probably the most famous round the world journey of its day was Nellie Bly, the most famous journalist of her era, male or female, who proposed to her publisher, Pulitzer, Joseph Pulitzer, that it would be a great publicity stunt for the New York world if she set out to break the record of around the world in 80 days and write about it as she traveled for the readers of the New York world. Anyone who could read the newspapers, and that included Annie, would have been very well aware of Nellie Bly's trip around the world. I have no doubt, although I have no direct proof, that Annie was well aware, as everyone was, of Nellie Bly's journey around the world. And I think she was a great inspiration uh, for Annie. Uh, Nellie Bly's journey was so famous, it became a popular board game after she finished the trip. And there's another Nellie Bly connection we'll come to at the end. As I mentioned, this was also an era in which cycling had taken off big time. What opened the sport to women was the evolution of the bicycle from these old fashioned high wheel bicycles called penny farthings, particularly in Britain, um, which were very difficult to ride. It was very difficult to get on one and even harder to ride one. But what opened the sport to women was the development of the so-called safety bicycle because it was safer. These were bicycles whose geometry looks like the modern bicycles that we see today. They were easier to ride and they really uh, captured the attention of women. The, it is really impossible to overstate how revolutionary the bicycle was in the lives of women at the turn of the 20th century. The bicycle became literally a freedom machine for women. It challenged every Victorian convention about what was proper for women to do. To be seen in the Boston Common, maybe with your ankles exposed, exerting yourself and sweating on a hot day for a woman on a bicycle really was challenging for, for a lot of people of that era. Doctors debated this issue. You know, many argued that women um, wouldn't be able to bear children if they overdid it on a bicycle. I mean, there were all kinds of obstacles that were thrown up. It was just seen as unseemly for women to engage in this kind of activity. Cycling also led to changes in the women way women dressed, and we're gonna see this in the evolution of Annie's own costumes. It was not practical to ride bicycles in these long skirts. And so bloomers evolved, and then eventually women started riding in, in pantaloons, and I'm gonna come back to that. So getting a bicycle, was a really a woman's declaration of independence. It gave her a mobility. She could get out, you know, she never enjoyed before. The physical exhilaration of freedom that comes with being on a bicycle was new for women. And they could get out further into the world than they could on foot. Um, now, advertisers, you know, obviously concerned that, uh, you know, who wanted to sell bicycles and concerned about this backlash made sure that they conveyed to women they would not be compromising their femininity by riding a bicycle. And the advertisements of the era, I think, tell you this. Quite risque for the 1890s, but obviously this celebration of sort of, you know, the woman as a goddess, literally on a bicycle. And the image for Peugeot, I like, because it's a woman like Annie conquering the world on a bicycle. 
So as I said, the bicycle very much became a symbol of the women's suffrage movement. Frances Willard who founded the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the largest women's organization of its time, wrote that she learned to ride a bicycle at the age of 53 because she wanted to take this implement of power and put it at her feet. And um, the year following Annie's trip in an interview with Nellie Bly, Susan B. Anthony said that bicycling had had more to emancipate women than anything else in the world. So that gets me to, a, I'm gonna tell you very briefly about Annie's trip, uh, which begins on June 25th, 1894, as I mentioned here at the Massachusetts State Capitol building. There's a crowd of about 500 people, uh, suffragists, curious onlookers, and my great-grandfather, Bennett, who Annie lamented to a newspaper reporter, didn't even come up to say goodbye. Now, I suspect he either, or both, did not expect her to get very far and thought the entire thing was Meshuggah. Now, this had to be a very difficult thing for her family. My great-grandfather and great-grandmother with two young children of their own lived in a flat in the same building as Annie, and they were gonna have a lot of responsibility uh, for helping out with these three children. When I finally, with the help of a genealogist, located Mary's, great, Mary's granddaughter, uh, Annie's granddaughter, Mary, I wrote to her a letter. We found her name on the cemetery records. I didn't know if she'd be interested in talking to me. I didn't know if she was still alive. And 10 days later, she wrote me back and she said, Peter, this is your long lost cousin, Mary. And I was thrilled. And a week later, I found myself in her living room in Larchmont, New York, never having seen a photograph of the woman I'd been chasing around the world for a year. But I had read in the newspaper accounts from Boston that she went to the town portrait studio to have a formal picture taken that day. And Mary had this picture in a frame, but the bottom was cut off. Uh, by the, you know, in, in the frame, and I asked her to take it out. And sure enough, this was the picture I had read about. This is Annie as she was attired on the day she left Boston. I want to point out a few things to you. Look at the clothing she's wearing. Can you imagine riding a 42-pound bicycle 10 miles, let alone around the world, in clothing like this? That bicycle had a very ineffective brake. In the back, you'll see... Um, a mesh, I'm gonna show you a close-up of that to keep the skirts from getting caught up in the rear wheels. She's wearing the white ribbon, which is the emblem of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. So this is how she began the trip formally. Now, I'm gonna show you the back of the bike. There's a placard affixed to it. This is where she got her name, Annie Londonderry. That is the logo of the Londonderry Lithia Spring Water Company of Nashua, New Hampshire. The spring was actually in the town of Londonderry, New Hampshire. They paid Annie $100 to carry this placard on the bicycle, the first of many advertisers who would sponsor her trip. Among other things, Annie was a pioneer of sports-related marketing for women. There are no earlier examples I've ever been able to find of a woman taking corporate endorsements for an athletic endeavor. I mean, nowadays it's commonplace. It was very rare in those days. The name also served another purpose. She was gonna travel to France, to Paris, which was you know, experiencing a wave of intense anti-Semitism. She elided a lot of the basic facts of her life as she traveled. Number one, that she was Jewish, because it eased her passage. She never let on that she was married or had children. It did leak out, and, but it was rarely mentioned. This is how the, uh, the water company also took advantage of her celebrity later in her trip. Newspaper advertisements, uh, this one coinciding with her arrival in, in Denver, Colorado. This is my favorite description from all the newspaper accounts, and I've collected thousands from all over the world. This is the description of her in the evening transcript as she got on the bike and went down the little hill that leads down Beacon Street from the State House. It says, then carrying only a change of clothes and a pearl handled revolver, Miss Londonderry sailed away like a kite down Beacon Street. She did, in fact, carry a revolver. She, she loved to show it to reporters. Um, it added drama to this entire story. I don't think she had any more experience with a pistol than she had with a bicycle, but it certainly added to the persona that she was creating as she went. <clears throat> 
Her first stop was New York, and I'm gonna move very quickly through the geography of this. Um, she arrives to New York City. It's a grueling six or seven days in the hot weather and these clothes. She spends about a week, in, um, a month rather, in New York, even though she's got this wager clock, 15 months is ticking away. She spends a month in New York, getting acquainted with the uh, New York world and tinkering with her riding apparel. This is how she was depicted in the New York world. And as I mentioned, the, one of the few newspapers that ever mentioned that she was a mother or had children. She did very little advanced planning. Her first real destination was Chicago. And why is she riding to New York? And then she rides up to Albany and then to Chicago? Because once you got up to Albany, you could follow the Erie Canal towpath. The riding would be flat. Um, but again, she wasn't physically prepared for this. The bicycle is 42 pounds. It takes her three months just to get to um, June, July, August, four months to get to Chicago. And she realizes that she's never gonna get across the Western United States before the snow flies and she's gotta go across the Rockies and the Sierras. So she gets to Chicago, she's worn out, she's lost a lot of weight. She doesn't think she's gonna continue. She tells the newspaper she's gonna just ride back to New York and try and set a speed record, a face-saving device, basically. But there's something that happens in Chicago that causes her to change her mind yet again. Somehow, and I don't know how, she makes a connection with the Sterling Cycle Works. They were the makers of exquisite, lightweight bicycles. And they offered her this bicycle to continue her trip. Instead of 42 pounds, she was now on a 21 pound bicycle. That's a lot of weight to drop on a bicycle. Um, it was a beautiful bike. This photograph of it was taken in San Francisco. That American flag, by the way, I should tell, just tell you, was given to her by a diplomat, American diplomat in Paris, who told her it would protect her wherever she traveled. Um, I actually have a fragment of that flag, the actual flag that her granddaughter gave me. She also makes a change in her clothing at this point, which also makes the riding much easier. And you can see in this advertisement for Sterling bicycles that appeared in several magazines, that she's now attired in bloomers. This is the beginning of the evolution of changes in her clothing. With this new clothing and a lightweight bike, she says, okay, I'm gonna continue. I'm gonna go around the world, but I'm gonna go eastward instead of westward. And if you think about it, she's now basically four months of this 15 months have basically been wasted getting to Chicago because she's now got to go all the way around the world end up in Chicago. She saved herself a little bit um, in order to win the wager. How does she make money? As her fame grows, she's able to attract more advertisers. So she's arriving in these cities like Buffalo and she collects advertisements and she stitches them onto her clothing and her bicycle. And they pay her to ride around as a mobile billboard uh, in these cities. And this was a thing that we, this would continue throughout her trip in the United States and, and in France in particular. Advertisers were very eager to profit off of her celebrity. So the Buffalo Express referred to her as an adver riding advertising agency. So you can imagine what a spectacle she was in far-flung towns to be riding in and a woman in men's clothing on a man's bicycle covered in advertising ribbons. This is the only photograph I know of that ever appeared of her in a newspaper in the Buffalo Express. Now you can't see it because the quality isn't that good, but that white stripe on her arm is an advertisement that's been stitched to her clothing. There was even a price list published in the paper, how much it would cost to rent her back, her arm, her thigh, Depending on what part of her body you rented, you paid a different price for the space. She gets back to New York, and I'm going to jump, cover a lot of ground, um, and sails for France aboard La Touraine. And she arrives in um, Paris uh, at the, in, in, Dece in, in December of 1894. Now, what I want to say about her sojourn through France, and as a lot of ways, she was covered extensively in the French press. And she had escorts of cyclists, and this happened in the States too, who would take her from town to town. You can see from this formal portrait, she was a very attractive, feminine looking woman. By the time she gets to France, 
she's a little bit, she's more muscular. She's dropped some weight. And she's, she's always, as the press in those days was wont to do, they always had to comment on her physical appearance. And she was always described as attractive. Um, you know, one newspaper in El Paso said, if you don't think she's good looking, you should be taken out back of a cow shed and knocked in the head with an ax. But she gets to France, they have a very different take on her uh, in this, oops, let me go, sorry, I go back. Um, this is what how one newspaper, Lyon, described her, that she belonged to that category of neutered beings, single women without husband or children. The suppression of love and maternal function so profoundly alters any feminine personality that neither men nor women and constitute a third sex. She was, her challenge to gender norms and traditional notions of feminine beauty was so extreme that it caused people to write this kind of stuff about her. Of course, little, little did this writer know that she was married and had three children. Um, and you can see she's depicted in the French newspapers, this is an illustration, in a much more masculine look. Those are advertisements, by the way, stitched onto her, onto her bloomers. Um, and this is how she's depicted riding uh, through France. Now, she boards a steamship in Marseille, and she's on that same steamer all the way to Japan. But she has very different accounts, which she is very creative about in terms of how she reached um, uh, Japan. Some reporters, and she would tell some reporters, uh, literally on the same day, she told other reporters a different story about riding across India and China. And to others, she simply told them she took the boat. She makes various stops on the steamship and, and ride, takes short rides, makes a brief trip to Jerusalem, which I write about in the book. I won't go through the details of how she got there. But she realizes that one of the ways she can make money when she gets back is lecturing about the war between China and Japan over control of Korea. And she collects these slides, like this one, that, I, that Mary, her granddaughter, had. I have 75 of these original slides including that one of the bicycle that I showed you that Annie collected. Um, and she decides she's gonna become an expert on the Chinese-Japanese war. She didn't really see any of the fighting. The timeline makes it clear, but that would not prevent her from writing um, <laughs> with great fanfare about her experiences at the war front that she did in her first person account for the New York world when she returned. You can see the sense of drama that she brings to this. While thus imprisoned, a Japanese soldier dragged the Chinese prisoner to my cell and killed him before my eyes, drinking his blood while the muscles were yet quivering. This was the so-called yellow journalism of the day. The New York world is what you would get if you had merged the New York Times and the National Enquirer. They had a great thirst for stories like this. I'm going to try and wrap up so we have time for questions, but she sails back to California, arrives in San Francisco. Uh, in the early spring. This is how she's depicted on her arrival. This is one of the lantern slides that was Annie's in the collection that I found in Mary's basement. She had pictures like this taken to sensationalize the lecture she was now going to give as she crossed the United States. And you can see she often told stories about being accosted by bandits. There were all kinds of stories of great daring do, but you can also see in this picture something else. And that's the further evolution of her clothing into a man's riding suit. I'm telling you, when she gets to a place like Tucson, think of Tucson, 5,000 people then, completely isolated pretty much. People who lived in Tucson barely went anywhere in those days. And in comes this woman who's been around the world. She's got all kinds of incredible stories. She's dressed in men's clothing covered in advertisements. Annie was all about being a spectacle. I tell people she didn't run away to join the circus. She became the circus. This is it's from, it's from Los Angeles that she's going to go to El Paso, which I talked about. I'm just going to mention, this is how she was depicted in the New York world, crossing the desert between Los Angeles and Texas. This may seem fanciful. But literally, when long-distance cyclists were riding in desolate places like this, the only way not to get lost was to literally follow the railroad tracks. 
And if they weren't, if the roadways or the, the ground wasn't passable alongside, you literally rode the rails. But what's important about this image from that accompanied her story in the New York world is I want you to look at the caption. The byline wasn't Annie Cohen. The byline wasn't Annie Londonderry. The byline was Nellie Bly Jr. Nellie Bly, that famous reporter, was having all kinds of issues with her editors at the New York world. She had married a very wealthy man in her, in much older than she. She had financial freedom at this point. And I believe, I don't know for sure, that the New York world was grooming Annie to succeed Nellie Bly. And in fact, Annie wrote a whole series of features for the New York world after the bike trip, some of them under the byline Nellie Bly Jr. or N.B. Jr. Uh, this is the, cab the headline of the New York world. You can see how they dramatized and again, how they referred to her as Nellie Bly Jr. making the most extraordinary journey ever undertaken by a woman. And this is the way she begins the story. I am a new woman. If that term means I can do anything, I believe I can do anything any man can do. Clearly staking her claim to, you know, kind of the, the banner of the women's movement. I asked her granddaughter, Mary, if she thought her grandmother was a feminist. And she said, not in the traditional sense. She said she really, she was not campaigning. She wasn't collecting signatures on petitions. She was not an activist. In some ways, she, she donned the mantle of the women's movement because it advanced her fame. But Mary said she was a feminist in the sense that she very much believed in a woman's right to control her own destiny. This is Annie in the late 1940s with her husband, Max, to whom she returned and had a fourth child after the bike trip. And that fourth child is the only one of Annie's children who had a child of their own. Because the legacy, this, and I address it in the afterward of spin, this trip was not without its consequences, some of them very difficult for her children. I won't say anything more about that. We can address it in the Q&A, but that's the, um, I know I had to cover a lot in a little time, but thank you for your attention. And Ari, if there are questions, we can, we can jump in. Sure, yeah. would you mind unsharing the screen? Yeah, you are sharing the screen, stop share. Okay, oh, I can see everybody. All right, I'm going to open the chat so people can uh, chat their questions. Hold on. Chat, okay. Okay, it's not I can see the chat, chat. yeah. Ah, here we are. I'm just opening the chat. Um, okay, so let's start with a few quick questions. Number one, how Jewish was Annie Londonderry? I mean, did she, in the book, um, you write in the fictional book that her husband was very religious and spent all his time studying Talmud or Jewish books. Was Annie religious at all? According to her granddaughter, no. She kept a kosher home. Mary sort of described her grandmother probably as more, almost as agnostic. So it's a very, you know, it's a very unusual marriage. <laughs> An Orthodox Jewish man married to a woman who's really, um, whose beliefs are really, I, I can't say for sure. But according to Mary, she was not, you know, she honored the holidays, honored her husband's desire for a kosher home, but was not particularly religious. So I, I should go back one step. First of all, I want to thank Jeff Kaufman for the introduction. So thank you, Jeff. Second of all, we just did a program on Riga, Latvia this week. So to have Annie as a representative of Riga is pretty amazing as a connection. And third of all, we're planning a trip to Boston to learn about the Jewish history of Boston and the evolution of Jewish, the Jewish community in Boston. So this book tied right into many themes that we're working on. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, in the book, I mean, you obviously in, in the fictional account, um, you, my, I guess my question is how much uh, creativity did you put into the book? Um, is there something that you definitely made up that's in the book? Um, you know, this you know, is, I'll tell you, this is what a number of book clubs that have read this. This is really what um, I think it is fascinating for book clubs to discuss what's true in the book and what isn't. Keep in mind that I was writing historical fiction about a woman who was writing historical fiction about herself in real time. So I had to first sort out fact from fiction, right? From what did, 
what, how much of what she said was true. There's a lot of that. Well, what I did in the book, and I think, and I didn't know, I didn't really realize this except in retrospect. It takes the form, as I mentioned, of a long letter that Annie writes shortly before her death to her then 16 year old granddaughter, Mary, but not to be opened until Mary is an adult and reaches the age of 30, because there's some issues of sexuality involved as well. Um, I don't want to give away too much, but I, you know, I, one of the reasons I wrote it is that letter, I realized in retrospect is that more than anything over the years, as I've lived with her Annie in my head and lived with her story now for decades, I would give, have given anything to sit, sat down with her for an hour or two hours to ask her all my questions and to have her tell me her story. And in retrospect, I think that's what I was doing. I was having her, in a sense, talk to Mary, but talk to me. So there, there are many scenes in the book. I think they fall into various categories. There are ones I can tell you I absolutely made them up. Um, but there are others, I think, that fall into an area where I, I would say they're, I can't prove that they happen, but I think it's entirely plausible that, they, that, that these things happen. Um, but I think, especially when people read the book, I think that's going to, if I, if I tell you what I, what was a, what was a, you know, came to me from my own imagination, I think a lot of the fun of the book is, is trying to sort that out. You know, I had one book, you know, group asked me if a certain scene was true. And I said, well, what do you think? And they said, the detail was so great. We're convinced that it happened. And I said, well, I'll let you know, that was actually one story that I made up. Um, so I don't want to give too much away, but I'll... Can I, can I ask though, um, in, in the book, you make the claim that Annie was a lesbian and had a lover in Boston who she spent time with. Is that I see, yeah, fi uh, fact or fiction? That falls into what I would call the plausible category. Um, you know, I do suspect, I didn't mention it, but I'll mention it now. When Annie was riding from San Francisco to Los Angeles, that's a ride that any reasonable cyclist could have made in a week, even then. But it took her six weeks. And she left San Francisco in the company of a very well-known uh, cyclist who belonged to the Olympic Club, a young, handsome guy named Mark Johnson. And he's still with her when they get to Los Angeles. And I just have a real suspicion um, that, that there was a romance there. Um, I don't know for sure that she had a romance with the woman who I write about in the book. Um, but I, when after the first book, came, and this never would have occurred to me on my own, I have to confess. When the first book came out about Annie, I was surprised by how much attention it was getting from bloggers and people commenting on it from the LGBTQ community who, for, who seemed to identify um, Annie in some way is, you know, of, of, you know, whose sexuality was somewhat in clear, you know, it wasn't clear, but could easily have been. Uh, and she was certainly adventurous enough. So again, that, that falls into the category, I think, of plausible but something that I, I created without absolute knowledge. Going back to factual, thank you for that. Um, Gail wants to know, did Annie ever get paid for her around the world adventure? That's a great question. So um, by the way, I think my comment in the trap only went to one person. I do want to say hello back to Esther Messing, who I, I'll have to connect with her separately. It was good to see her here. Um, it was Mary's understanding, because this is what Annie would have told her, that she actually received her compensation in the form of jewelry directly from Joseph Pulitzer. I don't believe that at all. By this point in 18, the mid 1890s, Joseph Pulitzer was nearly blind, spent all his time in Europe and on a yacht trying to, he, had, he was extremely sensitive to sound. He was almost going mad and he would spend great sums trying to in, find palaces he could rent where the engineers would come in to wall off the sound. He was not involved in the day-to-day -day running of the newspaper. So I don't think that's true. There's no way to know for sure. But 
she was a woman of very limited circumstances. Simon, her husband, was a simple peddler. They lived in a tenement. But she had enough money at the end of this trip to buy a house in the Bronx and move her family to New York and then send her children to private schools, which is a whole nother chapter we can get into. That'll be fascinating for Jewish audiences, which I'll try and touch on. Um, so, so I don't think what Mary heard from Annie was correct, but this really begs another question. What about this wager? Was the wager for real? Or did, was this something else that Annie conjured up because it made her story so much more sensational if you think about it. This wasn't just a woman going around the world on a bicycle. There was big money involved. The question of women's equality was riding on this. You know, you, you could, you know, she was either gonna vindicate the chauvinists or she was gonna vindicate the women who were arguing for equality. A lot of people by setting it up this way would have had a vested interest in rooting for her or against her. So, you know, and, she, and the timeline turned it into a race against the clock. I won't tell you where I come down on this question, I, um, but I, I think it's debatable whether there was a wager at all, even though that is consistently reported in newspapers all over the world. Did you find her covered in newspapers in Japan? Yes. I've, some of the English language newspapers of the day and Chinese newspapers. I have some clippings from, these are mostly English language, Alexandria, Egypt, Saigon, um, extensive coverage in France, uh, and even places she didn't go. For some reason, there was a lot of coverage of her in newspapers in Australia and even the UK where she didn't even stop. Uh, someone, I want to say, uh, Gail said, so Annie sounds like a pathological liar. You know, I do, and I, I say something about this in the afterward of the book. I mean, I have at times suspected there was something pathological afoot here. But I'm not convinced that was necessarily the case. I think she was, she, you know, yeah, there was definitely, well, she was definitely a, a flawed woman. And there was, a, there was a review came out yesterday in the Jerusalem Post magazine of the book. And the reviewer raises an issue that some readers raise is they have trouble with Annie as a character. I think you have to separate the book from the character. I mean, there are a lot of, you know, what would literature be without these flawed, complex characters? There are a lot of rakes, ruffians, adulterers, murderers who are central characters in books. We don't have to love them entirely for their stories to be interesting or of value. Um, but I understand it's, it's sometimes hard for people to get past some of the harsh decisions that she made. And, and in the novel, I have her wrestle to some extent with that later in her life. But I felt even though I was writing a novel and I had the liberty and it was quite liberating to be able to take liberties with the story, I still felt it was important to be true to her character. I didn't want to tie her up in a nice ribbon and make her somebody that everyone could love by the end of the book. Because that just, I don't think that would have been true to her. Did she keep a journal at all of her experiences? Oh, my biggest hope when I got that phone call from Mary was that Mary would have a journal. Although her base, she had in her basement all these slides and photographs and press clippings and some other souvenirs that Annie kept. She didn't have a diary. And she, now, she suspects that her grandmother was not disciplined enough to even keep a diary. Keep in mind that this was a painful chapter for the family. I suspect that a lot of things that might have survived otherwise Either people thought it was not going to be of interest to anybody down the road, or it was too painful to keep around. Because Mary did tell me that Annie spoke all her life about this trip. This was her crowning glory of her life, but she never talked about it in Max's presence. So, you know, how much more might be out there? I always hoped that these books might shake, you know, shake the leaves out of the trees a little bit. 
there might be somebody, you know, in El Paso who says, oh my God, that's my ancestor. I've got this photograph in my attic. This, maybe this is her. It's never happened. Do you have any um, detailed information about how she actually did the trip? I mean, people have asked questions. How did she eat food? How, where did she stay when she landed up at random places? It seems like she just made it up on the fly. It was a, it was a mix of everything. Um, you know, reports of her sleeping, you know, out of doors in barns, you know, startling a farmer in upstate New York who comes in to collect the eggs and finds this woman and her bicycle sleeping in his barn. Um, yes, I've got a lot of detail, mainly gleaned from these newspaper accounts. So I know, you know, for example, where she stayed at the Palace Hotel in San Francisco. I know what dates she stayed at the Orndorff Hotel in Tucson. Um, you know, very often um, newspapers in those days would report the arrival of out of town travelers. You know, in a place like Tucson, people were curious who's who's arriving from out of town. It was um, so you could even see, you know, in old newspaper accounts that Annie arrived in this city on this day and registered at the Vondome Hotel in El Paso, for example. So do I have it for every night of this 15 month journey? Absolutely not. I have a lot of it. Um, you know, food, I mean, there were restaurants, you know, in the United States anyway. The League of American Wheelmen produced these road books that cyclists could carry. They were the size of a map, you know, in dimension, but they had detailed instructions. You could follow very like turn by turn instructions all the way from New York to Chicago. And in the back of the book, was a listing of hotels that welcomed cyclists and provided a discount for members of the League of American Wheelmen. Sophist Cycling was a fairly organized and sophisticated endeavor in that time. Um, we just have a few more minutes and I'll ask the last few questions. So one question that we didn't get to, you and I discussed briefly was, where is Annie buried now? And have you found the grave and you found out where the family is? And I did. So the, well, as I, when I was chasing her, as I like to say around the world, chasing her ghost, the first cemetery I went to was here in West Roxbury, Massachusetts, because her parents are buried there. My great grandfather, Levi and his wife, born in the 1820s and several other members of her sister's family are buried there. But it was the genealogist that I hired that helped me find her gravesite in New Jersey at a cemetery in Saddlebrook. And when I went out there, when I found this out, this is before I even found Mary, there were a couple of things that struck me. Number one, my paternal grandparents, this is the other side of the family, are buried in the same cemetery, a uh, stone's throw away from Annie. That's just coincidence. But when I found Annie's grave site, she's buried next to Max and then three children, the three youngest children but not the oldest. And I just concluded without thinking much about it that the reason that the oldest child, this is the one who would have been five when she left, wasn't buried there was that she probably predeceased them. And that was my assumption. When I met Mary that first day and we sat down in her living room and I recorded our conversation, I said, so whatever happened, she was known as Molly. Uh, her name was Malky. I said, so what happened to your Aunt Molly? She, she predeceased her parents, I guess. And Mary started to tear up. I, I, I'm, I don't want to spoil the surprise. I'll just tell you that what happened to Molly will knock your socks off um, when you find out why she isn't buried with the rest of the family. She did not predecease them. Um, but that's a whole other chapter, and I do address this uh, in the book. So Wendy, in both, in both books. <laughs> right. Wendy wants to know the name Londonderry. She, she obviously took it. That was a marketing device. She used it to mask her Jewish last name on the trip. Um, did she ever use it again after she finished the trip? Did she go back to her? No, she went. No, she didn't use it again. Um, you know, one of the reasons it was so hard to, for the genealogist for us to track down descendants is, of course, many Jews who came to this country, of course, their names changed or they shortened them. So Kopchovsky at least for business purposes, because Annie did after, she had many chapters of her life, but she became an entrepreneur. She opened a, um, a manufacturing company in New York. They manufactured 
like handbag straps and straps for braziers and so forth. Um, her business name was Kay. They shortened it to K. So she went sometimes by Annie K, K A Y. Um, but as far as I know, never used that name again. Interestingly enough, to give you a sense of how little she sometimes betrayed about who she really was, she stayed with a family, a, a couple in France, uh, in Paris. Uh, he was a Sterling bicycle dealer. She stayed, the, the Sterling Bicycle Company. Uh, somehow made it known that she was traveling on a Sterling and she found accommodations with the, in the homes of the dealers of Sterling bicycles. And she stayed with them for several weeks and they, they obviously fell in love with her. And some correspondence from them survives to her that was written to her after the trip and it's addressed to Annie Londonderry. It, got, it found its way to her. How, I don't exactly know. But they never, as, as intimate as that relationship seems to have been, uh, I, I mean, intimate in the, friend, in the friendship sense, they never even knew her real name. When she was addressed as Londonderry in that, uh, in that letter, it was addressed to her as Londonderry, but the name was never used again to my knowledge. Last two questions. Carol wants to know that um, if you're gonna be speaking in Boston anytime soon so she can come to your book talk and get a signed copy of your book. Yes, um, so I, the, I schedule off the top of my head. Some events are you know, virtual these days, some are not. I'm going to be speaking at the West End Museum, which is in the neighborhood where Annie grew up, on September 9th. I think it's at 6.30, but if you go to the AnnieLondonDairy.com, there's an event schedule there. Um, and if for some reason you can't make an event and you want to mail a book to me, or, get, or I can mail you a book plate, but I'd love for you to come to, come to the talk. But the next in-person event, I believe, in Boston will be if hopefully it doesn't get canceled because of the resurgence of COVID, it will be at the West End Museum. And thank you for telling us about the West End Museum. It's not, it was, I'm researching a lot about Jewish history in Boston, did not know about that museum. So if we can get to Boston in June, maybe we will check it out because it, you said it has a lot about the history of not just the Jewish community, but the other many communities yeah, in, in that area. And they do, um, yeah, they celebrate the entire history of the West End, you know, as I said, very ethnically diverse neighborhood. So last question, I think it was Natalie asked, has anybody approached you yet about making a movie about uh, yeah, your relative? I, yeah, you know, but I, I gotta tell you, um, you get inquiries and the book has been optioned, gone out of option, somebody's got it now, it's a long shot. You know, for every book that, for every thousand books maybe that gets optioned and maybe one gets made into a movie, it's be kind of like winning the lottery um, but, you know, from your lips to God's ears, I, I, I certainly would love to see that happen. I think it's, actually, I will tell you, it's been made, it's been made into two musicals, one in Toronto that toured across Canada, and one in London at an off, the off Broadway, I call it, off the West End. And I found out about another theater company in, um, near Venice, Italy that's putting on a production that they've created about it. I, I don't have anything to do with these. Um, I just find out about them. I did attend the one in Toronto, which was incredibly creative. They actually used the bicycle as a musical instrument uh, in the show. That was actually called Spin also. Um, so it, it's gotten, the story's made its way out there. Uh, actually, this afternoon, I'm doing an interview with an, a reporter for Haaretz, an Israeli newspaper. So. It's a big week for Annie and Israel for some reason between the Jerusalem Post and Haaretz. So. And, and I, will, I will share those articles with our group. Um, Wendy Levinson keeps asking questions, oh, sorry, but, but, but we're not going to answer them because oh. they're in the book. So she asked, she asked about the name Londonderry. She asked about the husband. Oh, she asked about whether she looked upon as being a bad Wendy, mother. You should feel free. E email me. There's a contact page on the website, AnnieLondonderry.com. I'm happy to answer your questions directly well i think now we have wendy, we have, wendy, wendy phone call. i think wendy has to order the book look here's my copy you if, you have a book book. Club, if you have a book club and your book club reads it i'm happy to join the discussion that's what toby asked too so there you go wow what a great program certainly something i knew nothing about again ties into you know we've done 280 programs csp and all of a sudden we're we're learning in a spiral fashion so things are are coming together from different perspectives and this is a story 
a great story. I'd be shocked if anybody here knew about the story before, before Jeff Kaufman, who saw you speak about the story. So thank you. Thank you for sharing it. Thank you for thank writing. Thank you everyone for coming. Books. And Esther Messing, please message me. <laughs> okay, everybody. Take care. We'll see you uh, on Sunday, the last Kings of Shanghai. So thanks for lot, coming, everyone. Going on. Okay. Bye -bye. Take care. Get the book. Buy the book. It's on uh, Amazon and probably other, other places as well. Jennifer Malvin, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye, Mary. Tell Jeff we say hi. Bye, Viv. <laughs>